Thank you. That concludes the ministerial statement on deposit return scheme. My apologies to those members I was unable to reach, but I am conscious of the need to protect time for the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 9339 in the name of Liam Kerr on a thriving future for Scotland's oil and gas sector and its workers. I will allow a moment or two for, for benches to reconfigure. Can I invite all members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on Liam Kerr to speak to and move the motion up to seven minutes, please. Very grateful, Presiding Officer. Scotland needs oil and gas. It currently provides around 75% of the UK's energy. Domestically, the UK produces about half of that, and that's already declining, even with new fields. We have 24 million homes heated by gas boilers. Oil and gas provided over 90% of Scotland's heat demand in 2020. 32 million vehicles rely on petrol and diesel. Oil and gas produces plastic medical equipment, which our hospitals use to save lives. We use it to make fertilisers for our farmers to grow the crops that feed us, to make mobile phones and laptops that people are working on right now. And that demand is not going away. The Climate Change Committee has said Britain will need 16 billion barrels worth of oil and gas between now and 2050, which services a demand for electricity expected to nearly treble by 2050. I will come back to you, uh, Mr Johnson. And by the mid-2030s, oil and gas will still provide 50% of our energy needs because whether we like it or not, intermittent renewables such as solar and wind only account for about 4% of our total energy needs. And it is the demand that is the issue here, because whilst that subsists, we have to meet it from somewhere. Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful for giving way, but we do not recognise that 16 billion barrels is actually also what is left in terms of extractable uh, reserves, i.e. he may well be right that they might be the future demand, but we have gone past peak oil. This is not the future, it is the past. It's about transition, not continuing to use oil, is it not? Liam Kerr. It absolutely is about transition, and the fact is that he can't get round the demand point. And if there is a demand, we have to ensure the industry remains here, productive and profitable. Why? Because we need it for energy security, to reduce our exposure to places like Russia, for our economic security. This year, the industry will add over £20 billion to the UK economy, employing up to 200,000 people, 90,000 in Scotland, 95% of which are in my northeast region. It is telling that if no new oil and gas licences were granted, it would cost the Scottish economy, in a context where, remember, we apparently are facing a £1 billion black hole, £6 billion by 2030. In a second, Julia Martin. So it is imperative also to note that ending the industry early will lead to higher energy bills, as the Institute of Economic Affairs said. Which is why, when Labour launched what Gary Smith of the GMB described as a stupid and catastrophic policy that they would ban new North Sea developments, people were stunned. They asked, how on earth could a prospective party of government seriously put forward a policy that Smith described as economically utterly incoherent? Indeed, the GMB's Scotland Secretary called it naive, unnecessary and self-harming. Now, perhaps that can be explained by the UK Labour Party's ignorance, but that doesn't explain why Scottish Labour winds in behind this madness. Now, leaving aside, leaving aside that Anas Sawar hasn't even had the courtesy to acknowledge, let alone reply to, my letter, he was on representing Border just yesterday, backing the ban on new developments. And if there is any doubt about Scottish Labour's position, Remember, Monica Lennon lodged a motion last November stating no new oil and gas licences should be approved. It is signed by current spokespersons Sarah Boyack, Carol Mochan, Alex Rowley, Paul Sweeney, Mercedes Vialba and Martin Whitfield. I'll take an intervention from Gillian Martin. Gillian Martin. 
Uh, thank you. I take the point about, about demand. It is an important point when there is demand for something that we can't supply. But I'd like to ask Liam Kerr, with regard to demand, what are the UK government's plans to decarbonise the gas grid? Mm -hmm. Liam Kerr. The UK government is talking, in, as we've heard in the Net Zero Committee, huge plans to decarbonise, which is why we have the Intog round, which is why uh, the Ofgem has just had a new Net Zero duty. There are huge developments going on. As Gillian Martin, as an energy minister, really ought to know. And the SNP really have got a similar problem to Labour because they have a presumption against new oil and gas in their energy strategy. Now last month they wheeled out the First Minister to give some warm words to the industry. They also wheeled out Gillian Martin, Mary McAllen and Jackie Dunbar, all quoted in similarly ambiguous terms. But the people of Scotland can see the presumption is retained in the amendment by Neil Gray today. And this is the party of Nicola Sturgeon, who was so opposed to Campbell, of Minister Paul McLennan, who also signed Monica Lennon's motion, of Mary McAllen, who on the 5th of January was reported as saying, we do not agree with the UK government issuing new oil and gas licenses. And Neil Gray, the Energy Cabinet Secretary, who in committee last month both refused to back new oil and gas development in the North Sea, then said, this is not an area I have responsibility for. They must think the North East is buttoned up the back. The people of Scotland know that if the decision on granting licences for new projects was not reserved to Westminster, the SNP would be forced by their coalition with the Greens to block every application. The Greens, who sit next to them in government, whose Patrick Harvey claimed that supporting oil and gas makes one hard right. <laughs> Presiding officer, there isn't time to develop the point that actually what will drive net zero is the current North Sea industry. With these businesses, for example, helping to develop 13 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity by 2030 through 30 billion pounds worth of investment. Uh, other speakers will no doubt pick this up. Presiding officer, we have a choice. A choice between UK produced oil and gas and imported oil and gas. Imported from countries with weaker regulatory regimes and emissions targets and unstable politics and exporting our jobs. As Unite General Secretary Sharon Graham said of Labour's plans, grabbing the headlines is easy. Developing a serious plan for more renewable energy is not. I'm out of time, Mr. Johnson. She's correct. And neither Labour nor the SNP Green Coalition has that plan. The only party with a credible plan to work with our oil and gas industry and renewable sectors to get to net zero whilst keeping the lights on, our homes warm and the economy moving without losing the skills and experience needed to deliver the energy transition is the Scottish Conservatives. And And that's why I have pleasure in moving the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Neil Gray to speak to a move amendment 939.3, up to six minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I move the amendment in my name. The Scottish Government is absolutely committed to a just transition and ensuring we take workers with us on our journey to net zero. For the Scottish Government, the transition is both the outcome, a fairer, greener future for all, and the process that must be undertaken in partnership with those impacted by the transition to net zero. A tr just transition supports a net zero and climate resilient economy in a way that delivers fairness and tackles inequality and injustice. We will not do to the North East what Margaret Thatcher did to our mining and steel communities when people and places were callously discarded and jobs promised that were never uh, delivered. The impact of that thoughtless deindustrialisation is still being felt decades on uh, by communities that I represent in Airdrie and Shots. The oil and gas sector, and particularly the skills, and talent and experience in the North East, uh, and must play a critical role in supporting the build-out of low-carbon technologies in Scotland. We cannot ignore the fact that there is a climate emergency, which is why we have been clear that unlimited extraction of fossil fuels is not consistent with Scotland's ambitious climate obligations, and our focus must now be on a planned and fair transition that leaves no one behind. That means simply stopping all future activity is wrong. That could threaten energy security while destroying the very skills we need
need to transition to the new low-carbon economy. Neither can we put our heads in the sand, as the Conservative Party seems determined to do, and behave as though the North Sea contains an endless supply of oil and gas that is cheap and easy to produce. Oil and gas workers know how challenging conditions are offshore, and energy companies know how rapidly it is maturing. It is irresponsible of the Conservative Party to suggest otherwise. Their approach risks the economic future of the North East, would expose us to higher energy prices, and compromises our energy security. They do not want a transition. Instead, we as a party of government are acting responsibly. We are facing squarely up to the challenges and planning a managed transition that supports the workers and communities of the North East and all of Scotland, rather than the cliff edge that Gary Smith from the GMB described would result from Labour's plans uh, for oil and gas. Now, Scotland has the skills, talent and natural resources with which to become a global renewables powerhouse. Our draft energy strategy and just transition plan published on 10 January sets out our vision to achieve this, an energy system that delivers affordable, resilient and clean energy supplies. That will not only enhance our energy security through the use and development of our own resources, but means we generate enough cheap green electricity to power Scotland's uh, uh, economy and to export electricity to our neighbours, supporting jobs here in Scotland and decarbonising our ambitions of our partners. Uh, yes, I'll give way. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to understand the government's current position on the Rosebank licence, which we know sits with the UK government. Will the Rosebank licence, if approved, is that going to help or hinder the just transition we need? It's not a transition, it's a just transition for workers and communities. Um, it's a pity that Liam Kerr wouldn't take the intervention, but I would love to get some clarity from the Scottish Government, because I did write to Hamza Youssef ahead of his meeting with the Prime Minister, and there was no response. Communities deserve better than that. We have said very clearly that any future uh, exploration in oil and gas production in the North Sea needs to pass much more stringent uh, climate compatibility tests. I think that is critically important. We have already said that the, uh, the uh, unlimited extraction of oil and gas in the North Sea is not compatible with uh, our net zero targets. We, we are currently, we've just finished consulting and we are currently deliberating over uh, the, the responses that we have received to the Energy Strategy and Just Transition Plan, which will set out uh, a confidence later this year in terms of our policy framework uh, going forward. And that plan lays out over 150 actions, as well as consulting on further actions to help minimise a just, uh, maximise a just transition to net zero for our communities, businesses and workers. We are already doing the hard work of supporting the just transition, ensuring it is not, uh, it is not only just, but as swift as possible. The Scottish Government sees offshore wind as being uh, one of the most important economic and net zero opportunities we have. Our operational, under construction, consented and in planning projects, uh, together with the market ambitions expressed in Scotland and in TOG leasing rounds, now sets our renewable electricity potential pipeline at over 40 gigawatts. This could produce enough electricity annually to power every home in Scotland for 17 years. In order to unlock, I'm really sorry, I'm, I'm running out of time, um, I'm sorry that it's such a short debate. In order to unlock all these potential developments, we must build on our robust offshore wind planning programme to address the challenges going forward. There is a clear need for significant new network investment to ensure that our infrastructure does not become a barrier to net zero. And while we welcome Ofgem's recent decision to accelerate the approval of strategic transmission infrastructure, the UK Government needs to take action to provide the right powers to the Scottish Government that will enable us to modernise the planning and consenting system for grid infrastructure. Unfortunately, in that regard, while we have the energy, we do not have the power. We expect, in terms of the supply chain coming through, we expect the Scotland developers to invest an average of $1.4 billion in Scotland per project into our economy across the 20 offshore wind projects. We need to support our offshore wind developers as they meet their supply chain commitments. All of the... Um, I don't know if the I've got time. The Minister must conclude. Uh, I'm very sorry that, uh, that the debate is, is so short and we have such a, a small amount of time in order to debate uh, this is, these uh, issues, because I had much more that I wanted to say, not least in response to uh, what came through from the Conservative Party. So, to conclude, the rhetoric over, the, over recent weeks uh, has demonstrated uh, that it appears the Tories appear not to want 
uh, a t to want a transition, and Keir Starmer's uh, Labour Party appears not to want a just transition. Thank the Tories you, have no I regard for the planet. Labour have no point, regard for the workers. I am asking this you to SNP conclude, government Minister, so will please continue to plot resume a path to your seat. Zero and do Thank so you. with a just transition. I now call on Sarah Boyack to speak to and move Amendment 9339.2. Up to five Thank minutes. you, Presiding Officer. Today's motion from the Tories is the height of hypocrisy, so I move the amendment in my name. The Tories have been in power since 2010 and have presided over rising energy bills, but when it has come to the vital infrastructure and political support needed to develop the renewables transformation that we urgently need across the UK, successive energy ministers have dithered and delayed. It has to be a just transition. It has to be about planning ahead for both the short and the long term, bringing together our energy industries, using the skills and the leadership and the workers of those already in the oil and gas sector, but also in the critical supply chains and in developing the new manufacturing jobs and innovation that our universities are currently working on and that will enable us to deliver on our net zero ambitions. And there has been a lot of inaccurate speculation over the last few days. So it's important to get the facts right, not the rumours on which the Conservative motion is based and Liam Kerr's desperate speech this afternoon. Yeah. Scottish Labour is absolutely not turning the taps off now. We are working. We are working it's in the sector, and that is not that what is Keir not Starmer what has said on any but occasion, you nor you indeed an ass hour. not what he said. Presiding officer, we will Utter work with nonsense. the sector and the workers in that sector to ensure the just transition starts now, using our existing oil and gas fields that we have and maximising their effectiveness as we follow the commitments made at COP26 in Glasgow to play our part in tackling the climate crisis that our world now faces. And we are in a global race. No, it might have been somebody else. We are in a global race to net zero and we are seeing none of the ambition, the forward planning and the strategic strategic investment that our global partners like the USA are now moving ahead with at pace. The Tories are in serious danger, as was said by the Cabinet Secretary, of doing what they did to the miners and mining communities under Thatcher. Those communities are still suffering. We need to learn that lesson. Oh, I'll take a minor intervention. Liam Kerr. Well, I think the member needs to address the point that Gary Smith of the GMP said that the Labour plan lacks intellectual rigour. Who's right, Gary Smith or Keir Starmer? Keir Starmer. Boyack. I have to say it's Keir Starmer, Anna Sauer, Ed Miliband, working with the trade unions. I'm going to come back to this. Members. Because it's about serious investment in the way that we would lead in green manufacturing. And the £28 billion that Ed Miliband is talking about with Rachel Reeves every year for a decade, that will bring our trade unions on board because they will see those jobs from day one. But we need that investment now. We've got renewables projects in a queue because we don't have grid capacity. That's totally unacceptable. A grid was incidentally designed does not address the scale of change and the new renewables that we urgently need now. And 13 years on from the Tories taking power, they have not delivered on the renewables opportunities that we've seen developed in Scotland. I'm proud of the work we did from the start of the Parliament to set what, are now, what were then seen as radical targets. But but it's also bitterly disappointing that we've not seen the work by the SNP to make sure that our communities benefit from that renewables investment, whether it's the missed opportunities with Scotland or the lack of support for our councils to power ahead on delivering municipal heat and power networks and jobs and lowering bills. And jobs are critical to that. But as the STUC said in response to the vacuous Scottish Government Energy Strategy and Just Transition consultation, it fails dramatically, falls dramatically short of addressing the crisis faced by working people. And the trade union-led Just Transition Partnership said it's imperative that we have a strategy that meets our climate demands and ends fuel poverty. Instead, we have a restatement of existing policies. On the most important matters, it asks questions rather than taking positions. We need action now. And it is not good enough from either the Tories or the SNP because we've not had the focus on the jobs we need in our communities, bringing people's existing gas and electricity costs down. That means investing in retrofitting our homes and our buildings, developing heat and power networks that deliver real community benefits. I, I will indeed. 
Ms Boyack is in her last 30 seconds. I, I, I'll be very brief. On, on the jobs, does she accept the £200 million investment that is coming to Scotland from Sumitomo will bring 150 jobs? It's just the start of the supply chain pipeline that is coming from Scotland. Sarah Boyer, it's nowhere near ambitious enough, and that's the difference with Labour's Green Prosperity Plan. It will deliver the jobs and the investment in Scotland at scale that we need now. Value for money to taxpayers. It will deliver energy security going forward, a partnership between government, business and workers. Developing low-carbon renewables, solar, wind, wave and tidal, using all the resources in our existing oil and gas fields and the skills of our oil and gas workforce in Grangemouth. We cannot fall behind. The 35% of our households living in fuel poverty need action now. Thank we you, Ms. Boyer. I now call on to Liam MacArthur. Up to four minutes, please, Mr. MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. Today's uh, debate mirrors one we had about 18 months ago. Now, as then, uh, we need to start by acknowledging that maximum extraction is not an option. Oil and gas resources will have to be left in the ground. At the same time, the motion, I think, is right to point to the current contribution uh, of the oil and gas sector to our energy system, our economy and to tens of thousands of jobs across the country, though notably uh, in regions like the North East and Highlands and Islands. And when we talk about a just transition, therefore, we must accept that this will look different in different parts of the country. In my own Orkney constituency, as the Cabinet Secretary will well know, the Flota Terminal has been integral to our island economy and community, as well as at a national level, for almost half a century. The terminal has seen many changes over that, uh, over that time as the sector has matured. There's even talk of a potential green hydrogen plant being located on the site linked to the proposed West of Orkney offshore wind project. This illustrates the sort of transition we need to see, but it also underscores the complexity, the sensitivity and the tailored nature of that transition. And it's worth reminding ourselves that the UK Climate Change Committee scenarios anticipate oil and gas accounting for between 47% and 54% of total cumulative energy demand between 2020 and 2050. A marked reduction, no doubt, but significant and a warning uh, of the need both to bear down on demand but also avoid simply displacing domestic production with imports that are more environmentally damaging and create their own security of supply issues. In terms of those working in the sector, there's ample evidence of their willingness, indeed appetite, uh, to be part of the energy transition. And while there are certainly transferable skills uh, between oil and gas and renewables, that isn't always the case. Government and agencies must therefore do more to raise awareness of options and make the transfer, including uh, any retraining and skills development, as easy and as smooth as possible. This is a point made in my own amendment, but thankfully also one made in Sarah Boyack's as well as in the WWF briefing for this debate. It's also self-evident that any just transition will require both Scotland's governments to play their full, active and collaborative part alongside local government. The UK CCC were unequivocal on this point. Bluntly, this can't be yet another issue that gets sucked into a self-reinforcing and ultimately self-defeating arm wrestle over the Constitution. Neil Gray is right to challenge UK ministers over support for the Scottish cluster and development of carbon capture, usage and storage. At the same time, he also needs to acknowledge his own government's consistent failure to meet its climate targets, its inability to detail the action it believes will get us on track to meet those targets. That detail, for example, would be helpful in relation to the Energy Transition Fund, for example. What are the objectives in year one for the £20 million? How many workers will benefit and in what ways? And what are the predicted investments going forward in future years? We need this detail to address both the calls from the UK Climate Change Committee, but also to avoid the impression that this is more smoke and mirrors. Presiding officer, key to a just transition is the creation of new green jobs. We can't afford to leave people and communities behind. Achieving that will require plans that are radical, credible and, lo and lock in genuine collaboration between UK, Scottish and local government as well as the affected sectors. As I said in the previous debate back in 2021, on this issue, change is unavoidable, but only with detailed plans and proper resourcing can this be done in a managed and, most importantly, a just way. Thank you very much indeed.
Thank you, Mr MacArthur. And we will now move to the open debate. I would uh, remind members that it is speeches of up to four minutes. We do not have any time in hand. And therefore, uh, whilst members are absolutely entitled to choose or not to take interventions, any interventions must be absorbed within the members' allocated speaking time. Uh, and on that, I call Jamie Halker-Johnson to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Mr Halker-Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to speak in this important debate and to be able to remind members that while our oil and gas sector is one vital to the North East, it's one also which has played and continues to play an important role across my highlands and islands region. Yesterday, if I had looked out of the window of my home overlooking Scapa Flow in Orkney, I would have seen the tanker Aretea berthed at the Flotter Oil Terminal, the Pacific Ineos Grenadier at anchor and the Eagle Boulder and Pacific Treasures involved in a ship-to-ship -ship transfer, supported by local tugs Freya, Thor and, Orf Atof and Odin. And I would have seen the platform, the Safe Caledonia, now a familiar sight in the flow. One of my earliest memories of Orkney from 1979 was of an oil rig in Scapa Flow. That was at the start of the oil boom. And throughout the last four decades, the oil has flowed through Flotter. And the tankers, including some of the largest in the world, have been regular visitors. The oil industry is a vital part of Orkney's economy, providing well-paid and highly skilled jobs and supporting a wider supply chain. It has a GVA of 110 million and supports 167 direct jobs and 279 indirect jobs, with those in turn supporting at least a further 175 local jobs in the islands. And the supply chain includes many businesses that also support Orkney's growing renewable sector. The two highly skilled, highly successful industries working hand in hand, complementing each other, not in competition, as some might have you believe. Across the Highlands and Islands, according to Offshore Energies UK, the sector has a GVA of 209 million, and supports the jobs of more than 1,500 people. And it was in the Highlands at yards such as Ardacea, Kishorn and Nig that the oil boom was facilitated, building the rigs that extracted the oil. And Cromarty Firth Port has been a vital facility too, and will continue to be as the opportunities of the Green Free Port, created by both the UK and Scottish governments working together, are taken. And of course, the sector is one vital to Shetland, where the Sullumvo Terminal and the Shetland Gas Plant are still both major employers, and where decommissioning at Lowick Port Authority's Dalesvo facility is well established, a site I visited on a number of occasions. But the opportunities for Shetland and for the wider highlands and islands are not in the past. According to Wood Mackenzie's 2018 report, the west of Shetland is the place to be, with abundant oil and gas reserves. There are opportunities for decades to come, not just to support the local jobs in Shetland and the wider sector, but to help the United Kingdom meet its energy needs. And that's vital because oil and gas will continue to play a part in our energy mix for years to come. And by ending de domestic production early, we risk making the United Kingdom more reliant on more polluting foreign imports and at a cost of £1,100 to every person by 2030. But that seems to be a price worth paying for some in this chamber. Desperately, desperate to be seen to be doing something virtuous, regardless of the damaging consequences. We know that the green tail is now wagging the yellow SNP dog, and they are now too fit to stand up to their militant green bedfellows, or to stand up for Scotland's oil and gas workers. But Labour have no such excuse. And by talking up ending domestic production for good, Scottish Labour appear to be willing to let down the Scottish workers and the communities who depend on our oil and gas sector. And they are joined uh, in this opposition to, to new developments by the Liberal Democrats who are, standing, who are failing to stand up for those in the constituencies they currently represent. The Scottish Conservatives value our oil and gas sector. And with new opportunities in exploration, the vital role, can, can, uh, if the role plays can continue to play in the years to come. We will always stand up for the industry, for the workers who rely on it, for their employment, and for the communities it supports. Thank you, Mr. Halford Johnson. I now call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Ms. Nicholl. Thank you. For over half a century, our offshore energy sector has been an essential part of our economic and environmental prosperity, and it's ensured ener secure energy supplies across the UK. 
However, in their just transition review of the Scottish energy sector, EY forecast a marked and continued decline in North Sea oil and gas production, with around 80% from already sanctioned fields and less than 20% from new developments. New discoveries will be smaller and harder to extract. EY also report the industry supports 57,000 jobs in Scotland and is responsible for £16 billion of GVA, or 9% of total Scottish GBT, GDP. This contribution will reduce as decline continues. The term just transition refers to a fair distribution of burden and benefits of the transition to a low-carbon economy, and it tends to be used in the context of workers. The 2021 Robert Gordon University Offshore Energy Workforce Transferability Review highlights around 200,000 skilled people are likely to be required to support activities in the UK offshore energy sector. Over 90% of the oil and gas workforce have medium to high trans skills transferability and are well positioned to work in adjacent energy sectors. Around 50% of the jobs in 2030 are projected to be filled by people transferring from oil and gas jobs to offshore renewable roles. New graduates and new recruitment from outside the existing UK offshore energy sector going forward. And I commend the Scottish Government's support of the development of the skills passport proposed in the report. The draft energy strategy and just transition plan sets out the future energy pathway for Scotland, including offshore wind. And earlier this week, I visited the Seagreen Offshore Wind Farm, a joint venture that will deliver the world's deepest fixed offshore wind farm later this year. And in the 10 or so minutes, we were alongside a turbine being assembled. The nacelle, or cog, was lifted from the wind orca jack-up vessel onto the tower, demonstrating the pace of progress, but crucially using not only a blended workforce, but also recycled assets, including the Sea Green's operation base, formerly home to an oil and gas company in Aberdeen. And of course, there is still much to do. The RGU Energy Institute report, Making the Switch, highlights that to grow the industry in the North East, will require rapid and targeted investment. Getting this right has the potential to secure the region's economy as a global energy hub. However, if we move too slowly, we risk a hard-hitting economic decline. And I do hear this on a regular basis in my engagement with the sector, and I agree that this must be avoided at all costs. The members only a minute left. There is absolutely no doubt about the Scottish Government's commitment to net zero, and I was pleased to hear the detail uh, on this in the Cabinet Secretary's uh, contribution earlier on. However, I would still seek uh, reassurance on timescales as I set out earlier. Finally, a debate on oil and gas cannot pass without referencing the hundreds of billions of pounds that have flowed from the sector to the UK Treasury. Deeply disappointing, therefore, in light of this contribution, that the UK Government chooses not to match the Scottish... Um, the the uh, member I, I actually I, I should be Thank just you. now concluding. The she has Scottish one minute left, one second left. The Scottish Government's £500 million just transition uh, contribution to the vital work within the sector. So to conclude, yeah, I fully Ms. support... Ms Nicola, you will need to conclude because we have no time in hand at all. This afternoon. Thank, Thank you very much, Ms Nicola. I now call Martin Whitfield to be followed by Maurice Golden. Mr Whitfield. Uh, I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it is indeed a pleasure to follow Audrey Nicola and indeed to participate in this debate. And can I welcome the first um, part of Liam Kerr's motion about the Parliament recognising the vital role that oil and gas plays in Scotland's energy mix and in supporting tens of thousands of Scottish jobs, particularly in the North East. And indeed, Liam Kerr was right to speak about the demand and the need in part to control and service that demand because we know that where people lose their power, it becomes a frightening experience. Um, for them in this day and age, perhaps even more so than if we went back to the 70s and the three-day week. But let me help Liam Kerr with something about his request about the North Sea's developing future. 
The North Sea will not be turned off today or tomorrow or indeed in the future decades because of what is already out there. And out there, I don't talk about that stuff that sits under the ground, but I talk about the skills, the brilliance, the imagination and the entrepreneurial skills of all of those workers supported by strong trade unions who are fighting to ensure that they do not go through the history of the mining communities and the industrial communities did under Margaret Thatcher. And we have heard about the need to transition into a green technology, a green-based economy. And we need to do so for many reasons. First and foremost, of course, because of the planet and the fact we owe our young generation a future in which they can live and contribute and enjoy the same good things that we have today without having to hand over too much. But in order to do that, in all... Sorry, I'm... Oh. Minister, Neil, uh, come quickly. I thank Martin Whitfield giving way. He's performing an admirable job in performing a Scottish Labour reverse ferret on the UK uh, Labour's position uh, that was uh, pushed out. Does he regret the fact that Jonathan Reynolds uh, said that uh, the UK Labour would stop uh, new oil and gas production? Martin Whitfield. Well, I, I'm grateful for that intervention because um, good faith suggests that, that one should welcome intervention because that's the purpose of debate. But let us talk about the previous 13 years, where particularly over the last few years, we've seen rising energy prices, we've seen families concerned about how they heat their home, how they feed their home. And that is the responsibility of two governments, one that sits down south and one that sits up here in Scotland. No, I'm not going to go back on what Jonathan Reynolds has said, nor am I going to apply to it the cliff edge that people have spoken about. Because the Labour Party, both north and south of the border, are here to defend our communities. And that includes how they get energy, where they get food, the quality of their housing. It is about looking after those people who at the minute are working out in the, the North Sea on our oil rigs and allowing them to, to transition to highly skilled jobs. And I compliment Neil Gray on his comment with regard to the grid. Because what we need to look at is the fundamental supply of power and energy across the United Kingdom. And we need to do that in a developing, logical and technological way. And it is the Labour Party that will invest in that. It is the Labour Party that will allow that. Neil Gray is right in previous um, debates to have raised the number of um, energy projects that are stalled at the moment because they can't connect to the grid. Our communities need a good power source. And it allows me, in the incredibly short time that I have left, to raise what I always do, which is the importance of the nuclear sector and providing a base load for that. And indeed, if we look at Torness within my own constituency, that has produced enough low carbon electricity to, to save the equivalent of 84.8 million tonnes of CO2. That would take every passenger car off the road for over a year. I'm Thank you, Mr. Richard. And I now call Ma uh, Maurice Golden to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Burning fossil fuels is the biggest source of global carbon emissions. We have to tackle that to deliver net zero. At the same time, there's no point in pretending oil and gas won't be an important part of our economy for decades to come. The task then isn't just to reduce demand, but to ensure the supply is as low as possible. That's the practical approach that gets us to net zero whilst protecting jobs and giving our communities a future. Those of us with the privilege of representing the North East know how important that is. Oil and gas supports around 90,000 jobs in Scotland and a significant proportion are in the North East. That's people providing for their families, spending their pay packets in local businesses, and contributing almost 10% of Scotland's GDP. Attempts to fast-track an end to the sector can only inflict unnecessary harm on those workers, their communities and Scotland as a whole, which is why reducing demand must come alongside a just transition. The renewable sector is one obvious route. A recent report from Robert Gordon University found that 90% of oil and gas workers have medium to high skill transferability 
and are well placed to work in adjacent energy sectors. So, I welcome the UK Government joining other North Sea nations to commit to quadrupling offshore wind generation by the end of the decade. But decommissioning has great potential too. The North Sea Transition Authority estimates annual spend will rise to £2.5 billion per year over the next two decades, on top of which is the opportunity to cycle critical minerals, especially from renewables, back into the economy. It all adds up to helping sustain jobs and supply chains. But oil and gas workers face barriers, such as having their skills recognised in other sectors, the cost of retraining, and the lack of information on opportunities to do so. It's welcome, then, that reskilling is one of the goals of the UK Government's North Sea Transition Deal, alongside efforts to help the oil and gas sector reduce emissions. As I've noted before, those efforts would be helped by electrifying oil and gas platforms, such as through tying them into offshore wind platforms, further lo lowering the carbon intensity of North Sea production, which is already below the global average. No one serious about net zero sh should be arguing for higher carbon imports, a policy that could actually spur greater output from more carbon intensive basins. The public agrees. A recent poll found that 75% of people want our demand met from domestic supply. Not the Greens, though. They want our oil and gas sector shut down as quickly as possible. The SNP aren't far behind them, backing a presumption against new oil and gas, and now Labour have joined them in being out of step the member with is public about to opinion conclude. and environmental principles. Instead, they should recognise our oil and gas sector as part of the solution, with the likes of BP and Shell committing tens of billions of pounds to net zero initiatives. Working with them, we can unlock even more investment, cut emissions further, and provide the secure future workers need. Thank you, Mr. Golden. I now call Emma Harper to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Ms. Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Folk may be asking themselves why a South Scotland MSP is speaking in this oil and gas debate. But it is quite relevant to highlight and make absolutely clear that when we talk about a transition, actually, and it is really, really serious, when we talk about a just transition, that it doesn't just affect the North East. I have constituents and friends in the Friesen Galloway and the Scottish Borders who work in oil and gas, and I would ask that a just transition must include the south of Scotland as well. But more than that, the just transition does mean expanding renewable energy in other parts of Scotland, including in Defries and Galloway. DNG is already playing its part in renewables with onshore wind, solar, hydroelectric power like Drax, Galloway Hydro Scheme, and small micro hydro schemes, including at Penn Punt. Two weeks ago, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't have any time because the time is really short, so I'm not going to take any interventions. These three four minute debates didn't really give us enough time. Two weeks ago, I heard at a parliament drop-in that 40% of Dumfries and Galloway homes are off-grid. So, again, transitioning and assisting in a just transition to renewable energy for heating houses is extremely important. We have heard already that our just transition does not entirely eradicate the need for fossil fuels and petrochemicals. 87% of our oil and gas currently is used for transport, electricity and heating, while only 40% is used for plastic production. But plastics are essential and will include uh, uh, other additional essential items like heart valves and joint replacement components, such as in total hip and total knee replacement. So we need to be careful how we manufacture our language when we talk about this just transition for other products as well. It was making me think about personal protective equipment during the pandemic, masks, aprons and gloves. They use um, our petrochemical industry uh, manufacturing as well. So I would ask that the Minister in closing reaffirm that the Scottish Government recognises the diversity of oil and gas products and that this will continue to be the Scottish Government's approach. 
Scotland is an energy-rich nation with significant renewable energy resources, a highly skilled workforce and innovative businesses across a globally renowned supply chain. And analysis shows that the number of low-carbon production jobs is estimated to rise from 19,000 in 2019 to 77,000 by 2050 as a result of just energy transition. So this means there will be more jobs in energy production in 2050 than there are now. And by continuing to make the most of our vast renewable energy resources, we can deliver a net zero energy system that also delivers net gain in jobs within Scotland's energy production sector. There is a huge potential for Dumfries and Galloway to benefit from renewable energy investment, including through the potential of fixed or floating offshore wind at a site known as SW1 in the Solway Firth. The Community Development Trust in Eyemouth, in the east part of my region, has visibly benefited from offshore wind development. The community saw £50 million of investment before a turbine was even placed on the seabed and many highly skilled jobs were created. So I am interested in whether we can see the benefits that have been witnessed in Eyemouth, how they could be replicated in Stranraer. Again, £50 million quid could potentially come to the community and people could choose which projects could be developed before any fixed or floating turbines are even in the water. However, part of the issue is engaging with the communities and to see how we can achieve this. There is an option for potentially whether a framework for community engagement could be considered. Through conversations with the South Scotland Enterprise, I am interested in whether a framework for community engagement is worth pursuing, and so say are actually Harper, you interested in this. So, finally, presiding officer, Scotland is ensuring a just transition, but I will close there, as again time is short in this debate. Thank you, Thank you. Harper. And I now call Mark Roscoe to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Mr. Roscoe. Thank you, presiding officer. The topic of today's debate is, of course, on the most critical issue of our time, and it is worth spelling out what the overwhelming scientific consensus says will be in store if we do not alter our ways of generating, using and exporting energy. The IPCC published its final in a series of six reports in March of this year, the culmination of nearly a decade of study by hundreds of researchers. And it is brutally clear, let me quote, every increment of further warming increases the risks of multiple concurrent hazards. The clearest path to keeping global temperatures within safe limits is to rapidly phase out fossil fuels. And the researchers say this is needed in the near term and that renewable energy must be urgently prioritised. What are the consequences of not heeding this advice? They say increasingly irreversible losses across ecosystems on land and sea, increasingly insufferable heat in urban areas and in our oceans, and a starkly different future for our children and grandchildren. The scientists say our climate's future depends on our choices now and in the near term. Now, Scotland is not hiding from the seriousness of this choice. The Scottish Government's draft energy strategy sets out a way forward. And I'm pleased that the Scottish Government will no longer support unlimited recovery of fossil fuels. The development of the Cambo field has been halted, and the UK Government must now use their reserve powers to do the same for all new licences, including Rosebank. There is, I do not have time, there is no long-term future in North Sea oil and gas. Research undertaken for the Scottish Government makes it clear that under all scenarios, the North Sea is a rapidly maturing basin with little prospect beyond the middle of the century. So a responsible government and parliament must grapple head on with that challenge, securing a well-managed, supported and just transition for all working in the sector, particularly those communities in the North East. And that also means pushing ahead with site-specific just transition plans for Scotland's largest industrial polluters like Moss Moran and Fife. The decline in fossil fuels is irrefutable. Our choice now is whether we accept a slow withering of skills and expertise, or we grasp the opportunity to maximise the expansion of jobs in renewables and all the supporting sectors. Yet the Tories want us to ignore the writing on the wall for fossil fuels. The power over our future still lies in the hands of a UK government who retain control of licensing and who would prefer to sell out the North East chance of a stable transition in order to maximise short-term shareholder profiteering. And there's no guarantee an incoming Labour government would be any better. Keir Starmer's support for banning new licences for oil and gas in the North Sea is, of course, very welcome. 
But Anna Sawa has said that they might still allow the 500 million barrel Rosebank field to go ahead. That's an impossible circle to square, presiding officer. But we lie at a critical juncture. Less than two years ago, we all united over COP26 in Glasgow, and we committed to keeping 1.5 alive. And from what I've heard in this debate already this afternoon, there is a consensus. It may at times be an uneasy consensus, but there is a consensus amongst four parties in this parliament that we need to move beyond oil and gas, and we can do that in a just way which takes workers with us and puts workers at the fore. The only outliers in this parliament are the extremist Tories who are denying the reality of climate change. But the time for urgent climate action is now, presiding officer. There is no credible long-term future in oil and gas. And it is our duty as politicians, credible politicians, credible politicians, Ms. to map Ms. out Rusty, the alternative. And the Scottish Greens will be taking that duty seriously. Thank you, Mr Rusco. And I now call uh, Jackie Dunbar, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Dunbar. Uh, thank you, President Officer. It may come as a surprise that I actually agree with some of the Conservative motion today. I agree that the Parliament recognises the vital role that oil and gas plays in Scotland's energy mix and in supporting tens of thousands of Scottish jobs, particularly in the North East, and condemns the Labour Party plans to ban new production from the North East. I agree as someone who lives in, works in and represents a part of the oil capital of Europe. I know all too well the benefits that the industry has brought to my city and I look forward to when it transitions over to be the energy capital of Europe. We are all aware that even though the major use of oil and gas are often employed to generate energy, petroleum is used for many other essential everyday items. And we will continue to need petroleum for our household products, our beauty products, our medicines, our clothing, our construction, furniture, electronics, agricultural, healthcare, and even our children's toys. Presiding Officer Deirdre Meehy, the former Chief Exec of Oil and Gas UK, which later became of Offshore Energies UK, said at the first meeting of the CPG for Oil and Gas that I attended that there was going to be a sweet moment. And this moment will be when the use of renewables increase and oil and gas uses reduces to a point where both become equal. And Ms Mickey said that this is when we will experience a true transition and I couldn't agree more. And this is what we should all be working towards. Presiding officer, on the subject of just transition, I want to ensure that the staff who have worked in oil and gas, as many of my own family have, are supported in a just way and should their employment in oil and gas cease. Scotland is an energy-rich nation and the oil and gas industry has made a vast contribution to our economy, while it, its workers are some of the most highly skilled in the world. But Scotland's oil and gas basin is now a mature resource. The Scottish Government is responsibly taking action to ensure the sector and the communities it supports are supported in a transition to cleaner, greener energy system. Our oil and gas workers and their vital skills are essential to the transition. Workers and trade unions must be at the heart of everything the Scottish Government does. And with research from Robert Gordon University highlighting that a majority of offshore workers could be delivering low carbon energy by 2030 and that more than 90% of the UK's oil and gas workforce have medium to high skills transferability, they are well positioned to work in adjacent energy sectors. RGU's Making the Switch report highlights the potential for the North East region to become a net zero global energy hub that supports existing oil and gas roles into the renewables and low carbon roles of the future. Just on Monday, with my colleague Audrey Nicholl, I visited the Sea Green offshore wind farm and I got chatting with the skipper of the Windcat, who prior to working in the renewables industry was a fisherman. He then went to work in oil and gas, went back to fishing and is now working in the renewable sector again. This is just transition and a prime example of how easy it can be for skills to transfer. Presiding officer, in closing, the Scottish Government is absolutely committed to a just transition and ensuring they take workers with them on our journey to net zero. 
but we need to ensure we take the sector with us and recognise that we will still require petroleum. And even though that requirement will lessen, we need to ensure it is locally sourced. We have no doubt that it is the highly skilled workforce in the current oil and gas sector who will be best placed to transfer over to the renewable sector in a just and fair manner, and we will be at the forefront of delivering us our net zero targets. Thank you, Mr Barr. And we now move to closing speeches, and I call on Daniel Johnson to wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to four minutes, please. Four minutes. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Now, there's been a pretty serious attempt to have a very divisive debate this afternoon, but I am nothing if not a consensual politician. So let me start by genuinely saying what I agree with both the opening speakers from both the Conservative and the government benches. Because uh, 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 Liam Kerr is absolutely right. The oil industry is an absolutely vital industry to Scotland. It is vital in terms of the jobs that it provides, it's vital in terms of the income, and indeed the oil itself is vital. And we've heard other contributors point out this not just as an energy source, but as a, a critical uh, a raw material in terms of pharmaceuticals, medical devices, dyes, and many other products that we need in our day-to-day -day lives. Indeed, that is exactly why we need to think very carefully how we use the limited oil that we have left. And as I pointed out in my intervention, we've extracted 75% of our extractable oil resources. It's simply just not possible to open the taps, continue the oil forever. It's finite, it's going to end. And that's the reality, even without a climate crisis, we would be having to contend with. And can I also agree with Neil Gray that as we face this inevitable transition, we cannot abandon the workers. We cannot repeat the mistakes in the past. And we have seen it time and time again, especially in energy sectors. When we stopped using coal, we saw the miners uh, be uh, uh, plunged into penury. Uh, we've seen heavy industries uh, such as steel and others when the transition and the utterly callous decisions from previous Tory governments were made, leaving those skilled workers on the scrap heap. And we cannot afford to do that because the reality is this debate is not about the North Sea oil's past, but it is about its future. As Liam MacArthur said, change is unavoidable. So the Tories came to the chamber today claiming that this was a debate about economic realities. Well, let me give some. So they talk about import, uh, importing oil and being able to do that. But the reality is 60% of our gas was exported in last year, 80% of our oil. So that fact doesn't stand up. Indeed, if it's about price, just in a moment, about price, Greg Hans himself said that the, uh, 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 the, the volume of gas that we have simply would not impact global gas prices. And yet they were also arguing about resilience. Well, let me just gently remind the Conservative Party which party it was that sold off the gasometers, reduced our gas uh, storage down to days where the rest of continental Europe held weeks, if not months. It was their government, their decision. So I'm afraid their economic arguments are empty and devoid of any factual basis and without any context. And I think they should so happy to take the intervention. Uh, very briefly, please, Mr Kerr. Uh, very briefly. In 2020, we imported almost £3 billion in oil and gas from Russia. Why would the member increase our exposure to that regime? Daniel Johnson. Because ultimately, those £16 billion barrels of oil are just not enough to deliver a, a continued uh, supply to offset any of the impact on global prices that they claim to be purporting. And the reality is, and I'm happy to go away and do a comparative fact check, the figures I have in front of me are that 60% of our gas and 80% of our oil was exported. And we're happy to, happy to go away and compare those figures. But that's not the only place. We've heard uh, misquote after misquote. So to use and uh, point uh, of phrase me, from Johnson, a political Mr. source, Johnson, I think... Uh, Mr Johnson, sorry, you didn't hear me, but uh, just, we don't want sedentary chat across the benches. Mr Johnson, you will be bringing your remarks to a close very soon, I hope. Thank you. Uh, to, 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 to use a phrase that I think might have inspired some of the political arguments this afternoon, there have been many aspects of fake news. There's not going to be an oil shutdown or a turn-off. To quote Johnny Reynolds, who I was in the room when he said this, we are going to continue to be extracting oil well into the 2050s. This is about the North Sea oil's future 
not its past. It's about 50,000 jobs, £28 billion of, of investment. Mr. Johnson, and the reality is this has been a desperate motion from a desperate party who Thank know you, that they're, they're, they're on their way out. Thank you, Mr Johnson. And I now call on Gillian Martin to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to five minutes, please, Ms Martin. Five minutes, OK. A just um, planned tra energy transmission will not only recognise the role of oil and gas plays in Scotland, but will seek to harness the expertise, investment, capital and workforce within that sector. And the role of the, oil, the skilled oil and gas workforce makes, uh, makes the Scotland's present and future energy security is absolutely fundamental. Right now is our opportunity, as Jackie Dunbar said, that sweet moment potentially is, is in the horizon where we can bring stable employment and prosperity for generations to come. Now, obviously, the North East of Scotland is at its heart and will remain our energy capital, but this time around there's even more potential for that prosperity to reach all over Scotland. Orkney is already leading the way, as I've heard from, from, uh, from Liam MacArthur and uh, Jamie Halco Johnson. Emma Harper has talked about some of the opportunities in the south of Scotland region. But Mark Ruskell, in his very considered speech, did say that oil and gas production will be happening until at least the mid-century. And I want to uh, say that along the road, there are going to be peaks and troughs in that. We've already a sense of the pressures that workers are facing, both in the survey of, of over 500 workers that I launched when I was in the back benches, and uh, the, the surveys that we did as part of our energy strategy engagement and unions and interest groups are doing similar surveys as well. We saw in 2016 in particular what can happen to oil workers when the oil price dips. Yeah. And for many people that I know in oil and gas, constituents, friends, neighbours, this was the second or third time that they'd fa faced cliff edge redundancy. And with North Sea oil and gas fuels maturing, it's getting harder and more costly to extract. And the workers know that their product isn't as competitive as it once was. Those workers are looking to us to demonstrate the pathway to a more secure energy future, one that's not vulnerable to global politics or market shocks. And every householder, uh, one second, every householder trying to keep their homes wa warm wants the same. Transition isn't a choice, it's a necessity. And that's been demonstrated not just by the Scottish Government policy, but by business decisions that oil and gas companies are currently making, as Jackie Dunbar and Audrey Nicholl so, so deftly demonstrated. I'll take Liam uh, Kerr. Liam Kerr. And I actually respect a lot of the comments that the, the Energy Minister is making. But, so does she share my concern that the Scottish Government to date has only created 3,100 green jobs, doesn't have a definition of those green jobs and doesn't know where they are? Minister. Yeah, what those figures actually don't get, take into account the supply chain. Our supply chain is currently working in oil and gas, across oil and gas and renewables, so that doesn't take into account that. We, I mean, we estimate that there will be 77,000 jobs in the low carbon energy by 2050. And this is why we need the planning. This is the planning we need. We can absorb the 57,000 skilled oil and gas jobs and create a, a few thousand more. In fact, the challenge is going to be to find enough people that are skilled up and trained to actually service all the, the potential that we've got in Scotland. Scotland. Um, but, I mean, Mr Kerr, I mean, I know where he's coming from, but the fact of the matter is, this is why you've got to plan. This is why we've got to have a just transition yes. plan in place. Um, so, but my goodness, I can also say that we do need action from the UK government, who I won't, who hold key, LD, uh, uh, key policy levers with which to deliver a net zero future. Reform of the, the markets, reform of the electricity markets, access to electric grid has been mentioned, I think, I think that was mentioned by Martin Whitfield. Um, Decarbonisation of the gas grid, which I did ask Liam Kerr about, I was particularly interested to see how much hydrogen he thinks the UK yeah. government might put into that. Track 2 state has been given to the Scottish Club and the ACORN project, which I know my Scottish Conservative colleagues want to see as well. And Liam MacArthur mentioned the Committee on Climate Change. I should mention that the Committee on Climate Change have said time and time again that unless we have CCUS in yeah. Scotland, we will not yeah. meet our net zero targets. Absolutely. And people, our people need to see our energy choices working for us. One thing we should never, uh, never see again is Scotland's energy wealth being squandered by a UK government in the way that they did with our oil and gas revenues. Say that boy, it was right to talk about community benefits. I'm actively working with stakeholders and how we can make community benefits actually hit households in terms of their energy security. And Scotland's already exporting 20 terawatt hours of electricity, uh, renewable electricity to the, to the rest of the UK. And we have even more renewable energy potential. And it will largely be powered by many of the people working oil and gas. Our focus must be meeting the energy security needs, reducing emissions and ensuring a just transition for our oil and gas workforce. Our approach is pragmatic, 
realistic, responsible and worker focused. The Tories are not planning for the future. We are. And we'll take the oil and gas workers with us. Yeah, well Thank you, Minister. And I now call on Douglas Lumsden to close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I feel honoured to be here today representing the people of the North East and standing up for those jobs in the North East. And it's now clear from this debate that only the Scottish Conservatives are offering clear, unambiguous support to our oil and gas industry and the North East of Scotland. Yep. This SNP Green devolved government are against oil and gas exploration in the North Sea and would rather import our necessary energy needs from abroad with supplies coming from places like Russia. Their presumption against oil and gas exploration in the North Sea means a cliff edge for our oil and gas industry. They seem to be intent on taking Scotland apart brick by brick rather than supporting business. This tone-deaf response from the government to the needs of our economy is risking our economic recovery and will directly impact the pockets of everyone in Scotland during this cost of living crisis. And Labour are no better, with clear divisions between the party north and south of the border on this policy, with Anna Sarwar desperately trying to backpedal in media interviews this week, telling us that what Keir Starmer really meant was something different from what he actually said. But the oil and gas sector and the people in the North East will not be fooled. I will have a half time later. The Labour position is a joke. They claim to want to support the oil and gas sector, but won't allow new developments. Classic sitting on the fence as they try to appease their friends at Just Stop Oil and the trade unions who call their stance naive. Well, let me break the news to them. Without any new developments, we will run out of hydrocarbons well before we need to and then rely more on imports and throw thousands of jobs on the scrap heap, something that Sarah Boyack doesn't understand. But the GMB recognised this, as does the head of Offshore Energies UK, who stated today, we are importing from countries where they don't necessarily have the same commitments to the cli climate goals that we have. We are exporting our jobs and we are leaving the country poorer as a result. This is the result of the actions that others in here are taking. As my colleagues have highlighted today, the Scottish Conservatives are the only party with a clear message of support for our oil and gas sector and a clear message of support for the tens of thousands of workers and communities that rely on energy production for their livelihoods and well-being. Because make no mistake, while we still need to heat our homes, we still need oil and gas. While we still have an inadequate electric charging infrastructure, we will still need oil and gas. And while we still run 50-year-old diesel intercity 125s between our cities, then we'll still need oil and gas. And while we still need oil and gas, it's better for our economy, better for our environment, and better for our jobs that we produce it in this country. If I have time, we'll come back to you, Daniel. Liam Kerr makes this ex the excellent point that it is the energy companies that are using oil and gas income to pay for our energy transition through billions of investment. Companies like BP, Shell and Equinor. Audrey Nicholl and Jackie Dunbar had a visit to the Sea Green Wind Farm, both mentioned it, built in partnership with Total Energies, using income from oil and gas to build the energy of the future. This shows the importance of traditional oil and gas companies to our transition, something that the Cabinet Secretary seems to not understand. Yeah. Jamie Halcrow Johnson spoke well of the highly paid, highly skilled jobs our economy so badly needs, the opportunities in the west of Shetland that will mean so much for the local community. We can't just throw that away. Audrey Nicholl speaks of the 500 million Just Transition Fund. But she fails to mention the 16 billion from the UK government North Sea transition deal. And Gillian Martin talks about CCUS, over 40 million invested by the UK government, while the Scottish government zeroes their budget. We, need, we know that we need more investment in green energy production. One of the reasons why we're in favour of pursuing nuclear power. But we need to do this in partnership with industry, working with business instead of ignoring them, and working with communities throughout the North East to ensure they are leading on this issue. They are the ones that know best 
And if we are not listening to them, we are going down a path that will lead to job losses and economic decline in the northeast of Scotland. So let me be very clear. We support new oil and gas exploration in the North Sea, while there's still a demand for hydrocarbons. We believe in a just transition for the creation of green jobs. We support funding for any oil and gas worker that wants to reskill in renewables. We support the 90,000 workers who depend on the sector. And finally, presiding officer, we're the only party who will support the northeast of Scotland, its towns, communities, and its people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lumsden. That concludes the debate on a thriving future for Scotland's oil and gas sector and its workers. And there'll be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow frontbench teams to change position. Thank you.